Hello, and welcome to the Mind by Design podcast. I'm your host, Jana Parker, licensed educational psychologist, parent coach, and educational consultant. Visit themindbydesign.com to find resources and access our services, and please follow us at The Mind by Design on both Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for joining us again on the Mind by Design podcast. I'm Jana Parker, and I'm here, here with Michael Prater right? Prater from Tessellations. And he's actually from the high school, which is a new program that I am excited to learn about. So thanks for joining me, Michael. It's my great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, So yeah, uh, tell me about how the, you know, the inception of the high school program at Tessellations and just kind of what it's all about and what your role is there. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I um, encountered tessellations. I've I've been a I've been on another coast um, for the overwhelming part of my career, and um, I uh, learned about tessellations over the summer, and um, found out that they were building a high school and came to know about the kindergarten through eighth grade, and I was just deeply moved um, from the first conversation that I had with the founding head. Um, to when a couple weeks over, uh, a couple weeks later, I brought my entire family and my four-year-old twins out um, to Cupertino in order to get to know the school and understand more about the atmosphere and the culture. Um, I met the founding visionary and Beneventi. And, you know, coming from a, a somewhat traditional educational space, I've been a, mainly a high school person, um, director of high school, high school and middle school. Um, ultimately a, a head of school of the Italian School of New York, um, where I served in an interim capacity. I'm not Italian, uh, <laughs> um, but um, that allowed me to have a, you know, sort of a, a really nice K to 12 vision as well. And so um, when I um, started at Tessellations, I was just really moved by the sensitivity of of the the kids at the school uh the culture around um this atmosphere of gifted learning um and the um the, being in a project based space where kids are really um catered to the sensitivities around everything from social justice to what it is to be really advanced um, in some area of study of your life and maybe on grade level or kind of getting up to grade level in something else. And just the wonderful energy that exists in a space where kids are motivated intrinsically to learn, um, where kind of uh, a lot of the competition that typically happens in schools is, is mitigated through you know a, a careful and intentional culture. And as I got to know more about this relatively young school, it's only four years old, um, I was really moved. And their desire to have a high school capstone um, to serve as the fourth division of the school um, is something that I was really excited about. So often in education, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're taking care of a, of a building that someone else built. It's, it's really, really rare that we get to ask ourselves in this moment, what really matters? Um, what are some of the systems that are antiquated that need to be maybe reimagined, maybe moved forward, maybe revolutionized? And how can we make sure that we as educators are honoring this moment? Um, we have a real big responsibility to young people today, as well as their parents, um, as well as the future, uh, to make sure that capable, gifted, wise kids, um, kids, kids with abilities are cultivated and that their creativity is not atrophying. And I think that there's a really extraordinary body of research that's becoming mature right now and for the last 10 years or so that allow us to build the kind of school that honors this moment and that respects the dignity of, of young people and sets them up to solve some of the problems that um, some of us uh, gray bearded folks might have helped to cause yeah. um, over the past. And um, I think we really have a responsibility to make sure the school is relevant, especially high school. Right. And um, that's that's why I'm really excited about this project. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find out living on another coast? You know, were you looking for something different? Were you looking to move? You know, what inspired you to even 
or how did you even get involved? Yeah, you know, um, I was, um, as, as I was saying, the, the, the non-Italian interim head of the Italian school, and I, I'd been expecting to have that job for around six months as they were looking for um, a, a head of school that would uh, a legacy of the Italian school of New York City. And, um, you know, I did my my best to kind of shepherd in um, a new head of school, and I began to look elsewhere for another project. I have been um, a progressive educator at heart for my entire life, um, but I've also cared about other things. I, I, I found La Scuola d'Italia um, 20-something years ago mm. and um, was really moved by what it is to be in a bilingual space. Um, as a non-Italian who didn't speak Italian at the time and learned a language over the course of of, of my time there, um, there were so many wonderful aspects culturally. Um, you know, I feel like I, I had a master's class in Italian literature and art, not to mention food and some other kind of wonderful things. So it was really an extraordinary time. But I also felt that there were some other parts of my career and my mind um, that were um, maybe itching to try something new. Yeah. Uh, I was a, I was a COVID era head of school as well. And so much of the excitement about this current job, when I think about, you know, I sort of sometimes felt like I was running an infirmary, um, at times over the course of COVID. And, um, when I finally had a moment to take a breath and go back and read the books, maybe that I would have otherwise been reading about education, uh, about creativity, about intrinsic motivation, and the opportunity to um, dig into some of that, uh, like I said, maturing research has been just a, a very powerful, intellectually stimulating um, uh, opportunity for me. And I think that the primary thing that I'm really excited about is I feel like so many of our systems are really in contradiction to most of our values. And the opportunity in a high school space to ask ourselves, like, as we think about how we do assessment, as we think about um, policies on retaking tests, all of the different decisions that we make that, that formulate the systems for high school, I think are a little bit retrograde. And mm -hmm. it's time to think about them. It's time to ask ourselves, what are our values? What are our systems? And if our systems are not in line with our values, well, let's look at the research to identify the kind of things that will make a better high school experience for kids, not just so that they're prepared, which certainly we want them to be, but so that their hearts um, and their minds are feeling better about themselves. And high school doesn't feel like a, like a, you know, like uh, crawling, you know, up the side of a cliff to get someplace when there's stairs around the corner that have a much nicer view. Yeah. 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 I have a stepson in high school right now and um, I feel like he struggles with a lot of, you know, like the why, you know, why am I doing this? This is so stupid. You know, just like a lot of his experience, he's kind of um, pushing back against it. And it's hard as a parent to watch that and also to know like, well, you can't just, you can't just not, you can't just not do your English class. Like you have to. Right. I mean, right. but then you're also saying like, you've got to do this thing that you don't, it, you're not enjoying. You feel like it could be done a better way. You don't see the point of this. We know you're a great reader, a great writer, a great speaker, yet you're potentially going to fail your English class, you know, just because you're not inspired in it really. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, challenging to watch that and to know like that they're really you know there isn't another option at that high school of what you need to do you know but don't start failing a freshman high school like English class because then you just got to go to summer school you know? <laughs> right 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 and yeah. you know what I think about with 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 that specific circumstance is that you know um whether it's giftedness or just curiosity mm -hmm these um these dispositions are fragile and they can atrophy and i think a lot about you know coming from this italian school and, and having been immersed in italian culture i think a lot about leonardo da vinci who grew up 
as an apprentice in a workshop of a gentleman named Verrocchio. It was a wonderful multidisciplinary space. His curiosity was cultivated. He was mentored and he went on to invent things and achieve things that are still resonant today that saved the very existence of a number of Italian cities because his curiosity was cultivated. And I just think about if this young Leonardo had been put into a school where he was just banging his head against the wall, doing meaningless assignments, seeing no relevance on what he was doing, we wouldn't know his name today. Mm -hmm. And how many little Leonardos are stuck in a system that is not cultivating them and the problems that they might have solved in their adulthood that might have changed the trajectory of humanity for the better, just it just didn't happen. Yeah. And I really think that in this moment right now, we have an enormous responsibility as educators because we've got problems. It's no joke when we think about whether it's climate, whether it is you know, how we're going to navigate AI, what, whatever the, 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 the big forces in our world are, we've got the young people today who are going to solve these problems hopefully tomorrow. And it's our responsibility to give them self-confidence and dignity. So they're excited to engage and not get disenchanted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect segue for you to tell me about the high school program at tessellations. I'm, I have so many questions, but I'll just let you kind of start and then I'll follow up with all the questions. Yeah. Well, we're, um, we're honoring the, um, system that has been established in our K to eight, um, which is to have a project based or, you know, thematically, uh, a thematic curriculum, um, in our high school. Um, Can and you explain that a little bit for people who might be listening and are new yeah. to that term. Sure, sure, sure. I guess I would I would um, start by saying that the way that most high schools were designed um, and and have been designed for the last hundred and thirty uh, or so years um, uh, grew out of a factory model where you have English and history and math and science. And um, maybe every once in a while, um, you know, the English teacher and the science teacher kind of gets together and and, and does something and and that's awesome, you know. Um, but I think that what a, uh, a school really needs to do is be much more thoughtful and intentional about creating learning experiences that are going to more naturally combine uh, the elements of the curriculum. Uh, to go back to Leonardo, when he was in the workshop, it, it, he, it wasn't that he could only work on English until the bell rang, right? You know, these things are combined. You know, he was a poet. He was an architect. Um, he was an engineer. He was a painter. And all of these things work together. Likewise, the, um, the, the, the values and the systems work together. And so the opportunity that we have to create a holistic program is something that we're taking very seriously and something that we're honoring. Um, so as such, um, we are designing uh, classes that are going to give kids the you know, the, 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 the cultural understandings that they need to know, the, the mathematical knowledge that they need to have, um, the, the scientific practices that they need to know, the, the um, you know, the global mindset you get from foreign languages, all the stuff that you need to have in high school. But um, presenting these lessons through learning experiences that are interdisciplinary and that have an eye on things in what I like to call the world we all share. Um, it's funny how often in high school you refer to the real world because so much in high school seems like it's English teacher going to use a, a, a fun word, sui generis, like these are things that only exist in high school. And the thing is that what kids need are durable skills, right. which is to say that skills that are going to be transferable from the learning environment in high school to things that take place of the high school. Um, it's really, really fundamental to give kids a sense of relevance because when kids feel relevance, um, they're moved to work harder because mm -hmm. they feel like it matters. Um, you know, I, I've worked in, in high schools for more than 20 years, certainly seen my share of disenchanted kids, but uh, I, I think when they're disenchanted, it's kind of our fault. 
Um, I think that kids want to be successful. They want to feel smart. They want to feel capable. They want to have a sense of agency. And we need systems that promote their agency. And the bet that we're placing at Tessellations is that if we bet on the curiosity and agency of 15 year olds, they're going to come through. They're going to work harder because it's going to matter. Um, right. It's going to matter for them. Right. Okay. So um, this is to say that we have, you know, the the curriculum that is um, thematic and, and and interlaced at the same time. Um, we are betting pretty big that uh, project management and the way that that overlaps with executive functioning skills is going to be something that's super relevant. And so in the same way that my previous school, which was a bilingual school, we, we dedicated a a chunk of time every day to make sure the kids were learning their 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 second language, their target language, in addition to their mother tongue. Um, we are uh, emphasizing a studio workshop space, and we have partnered with uh, something that I'm really very excited about, uh, which is a uh, a school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which I've gone to visit and learned a lot about, called New View. Um, N U V U. Look it up. It's a pretty cool oh. place. And what they've done is put together a, a number of studio workshops that are interdisciplinary, that have uh, very thoughtfully um, cultivated systems for teaching kids how to go from identifying a problem in the world we all share, empathizing with an end user, brainstorming about solutions, and going through a process from, uh, from brainstorming to prototyping to feedback, to um, seeing through one of those prototypes, to presenting their work, and eventually having an end user um, that is making use of, of the thing that they've created. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you go onto their website, you'll see all kinds of cool things that kids are making. Um, the thing that doesn't seem so cool that I'm actually really excited about is the process. I really believe that kids need to be able to move through a step-by-step -step process. Um, when you see a big project, it's intimidating, but whenever you recognize a big project is just a series of steps that you can work yourself through, it makes it a little bit easier and it makes it more valuable. And whenever you have a process to solve a problem, um, you can get a little bit more excited about the possibility that you're actually going to get there and see it through. And this aspect of project management, how it overlaps with self-efficacy, I think is just an extraordinary gift that we can give to young people uh, before they graduate. Um, so this piece is also really exciting to me because there's sort of a, a unified theory, um, which is what we're calling it for the time being, of um, social emotional learning, um, DEI, and executive functioning. And, and, and these are things that are fundamental to be studied separately, of course. But the places that they overlap, I think are very, very powerful. When I reflect on when I'm trying to do a project and I hit a wall, I get stuck. It's probably has something to do with my self-esteem or something that's going on in me, which is SEL. It might be because I'm having difficulty working with someone who might be a little bit that's when DEI can come in. And at the same time, functioning to recognize how is it that I'm idea to finished product in a way that, it, uh, that gives me skills that are transferable. They're kind of really important aspect uh, to the school and to our program. Wow, yeah. So. That was so much and amazing. <laughs> the um, so, gosh, okay. So tell me a little bit logistically about how this works. You know, I'm assuming the kids come for the school day, and they have different classes throughout the day. Um, you know, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would say that um, in certain ways, it, it, it looks like a, a somewhat standard model of, of high school with, okay. with a few things that we're uh, being much more intentional about. Um, one of the things I was mentioning earlier is, is, a, is a maturing body of research about how to create a culture of creativity and how to make sure that kids are, are, are well. You know, I think wellness in school yeah. is not just a buzzword like Kids, kids are 
you know, hurting themselves um, in worst case scenarios. They're overly stressed out when they don't need to be um, in, in, in maybe um, less daunting scenarios, but a lot of it's unnecessary. Um, and so, you know, one of the uh, organizations that we've been um, leaning on a lot to um, take advantage of just, you know, up to date research is Challenge Success, who has uh, a lot of advice about how to structure a school day, um, when to start the school day, um, how to build in flex time, how to take advantage of student agency, and the way that this works out in, in some ways is, you know, having uh, classes that start when high school kids' brains wake up, which is around, you know, nine, not around seven. Um, having, you know, classes that are going to take place at, at different times uh, throughout English in the morning on one day, in a longer block, and uh, a few days later, you're having, you know, English at a different time of day on a shorter block, uh, building in flex time so that students can, you know, maybe they check in with their teachers or maybe they just have downtime. Um, there's a lot of research that says that downtime is not a waste of time. And, um, you know, this is another area where I think our, our, our values and our systems in most traditional high schools are just, there, there's, there's, a, there's, there's not a match. And this is one of the ways that, that we can make sure that that does. Um, having different modes of learning that are taking place throughout the day. Um, in a way, our studio workshop class is going to be, you know, it, it's going to be some, some some brains, it's going to be some hands, it's going to be some heart. But uh, the point is that it's not just that you're at a desk um, all day, you do get to get up and you get to move around. Um, we are having, you know, the the, the classes that, that we need to have, both in terms of honoring the tradition of high school, which is something I really care about, um, despite my progressive vision. I, I think that certain aspects of high school are timeless and, and those need to be honored. Uh, but at the same time, there are some not too revolutionary um, shifts that we can make um, that allow this to be a much nicer uh, space. Uh, a couple of the other things that we're doing, um, we're having a, a three-week term, which is a uh, something that's becoming increasingly common uh, among schools, which I think is a great movement that we're a part of. Um, to have, you know, a three week term where you're just going to do a deep dive into, you know, one specific class. Um, one of the things about gifted learners, but I think also a, a, a lot of people just with curiosity is they like to go deep. They like to go really, um, you know, study something uh, profoundly um, in, in different modes. And so we'll have a three week term that allows kids to do that. Um, they could also do a studio for three weeks. Um, we're also doing a handful of other things that are that are kind of exciting. We'll take kids to a different continent every year for four years. I come from international schools. I've got a lot of connections and I want to make sure that kids learn, you know, resilience and what it is to um, have cultural competencies and, 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 and to wake up in the home of someone else in a foreign country and, and walk out and, and have a, have a coffee and talk with them and know what it is to, to be able to go around the streets. And, and, um, and uh, that's, you know, that's another um, important part of, of self-efficacy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, about how, so this is the first year um, of the high school mm -hmm. and um how many students are you serving? And did they yeah. all come from Tessellation's eighth grade or did you accept new students? And if people are interested, you know, how do they go about applying? And is it like, can you do it mid-year? Can you come in any time? Do you have to, you know, that kind of stuff? Sure, sure. Yeah, we're doing rolling admissions. Okay. You know, to, to join on to uh, a new high school is something that's, kind of cool to put on your college resume. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, we're processing applications and we have been since uh, since November. Um, we have kids uh, from our own eighth grade who are going to come into the high school who have already committed to doing so. Um, and, uh, you know, we're doing, we have ad admissions events and, and and all of these things, open houses as well, um, through, the, through the website, Tushlet tessellations.school. Um, you can go through the applications process. A lot of our peer schools use Ravenna. Right. Um, we have a, a system that's a little bit homegrown. Um, being where we are, we have a lot of uh, folks who are very comfortable in the computer science realm who have put together a nice process um, for us. 
but uh, there's a little bit of writing, there's a standard application, and um, kids will will go through an interview process, and then we bring them on campus, and we've already had one of those on-campus days, and we'll be having another one um, in a couple weeks. Um, and yeah, that's 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 essentially our system. We will have rolling admissions probably through the end of the the current academic year. Did you um, did you start with a ninth grade, or we're starting with a ninth grade, and then we're then we're growing up. So next year we'll have a ninth grade. The following year we'll have a ninth and tenth grade. One of the things about um, tessellations as well, as I was saying, it was um, you know it's just four years old. Uh, it started as sort of a COVID pod um, yeah. a few years ago during that, you know, that really challenging moment in the yeah. history of, of, of all of us families and, and folks in schools. And uh, the school has grown pretty dramatically. At present, we have 190 kids. And so we will be growing uh, the high school in a similar way. We're, we're, we've got, you know, a, a school culture that we want to honor. And it's challenging as we know, to both grow and have a, a culture that coheres to something that's familiar to the folks that have been in a culture for a little while. So mm -hmm. we're being pretty intentional about how the school grows and um, trying to ensure that we maintain that Tessie thing that is Tessie, that, that makes it what it is that you feel uh, when you're on campus. And I, if you haven't come by and visit, I think you have for I an have, open house. Yeah. yeah. So um, maybe that's something that that I hope that you felt um, when you were there. Yeah, I was surprised because um, it was a previously a school that was in the school district that I had worked in. And I was like, oh, I know this, you know, but it looked completely different mm -hmm. <laughs> in a positive yeah. way. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a really it was a really nice place to be. And I saw where the high school was starting. So, yeah, I think mm -hmm. I came over the summer. Yeah. No. So we're going to be at the beginning of the school year. Yeah. Yeah. It was in the fall. Yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. And uh, we'll start off on the the campus with the K to eight um, in um, you know in the year in the academic year to come. After that, we'll move off campus once we have a critical mass of students of a ninth and tenth grade. It's enough to kind of formulate a space, and we'll sort of be near De Anza in um, in downtown Cupertino. Oh, great. And um, yeah, I think that the the idea, the plan that we have is to have classes of around 60 to 70 kids once we're sort of like um, fully, fully grown and, and mature. So in about five years, the idea is that we'll have a high school that has around 250 to 300 kids. That size and that uh, that number enrollment wise is really important for us because it's sort of the sweet spot between a school that's small enough that you know everyone's face and there's a lot of research about like the the size of a community the number of faces that can exist in a, in, a, in any given all enough to have that kind of like uh, recognition but to be large enough to have a fully robust you know arts curriculum and sports and all the stuff that you kind of need to have um high school feel like um yeah. like a, a big enough place i do think that um it is something that most high schools are probably too big um they're working at scale and there's and there's financial reasons for that mm -hmm. of course but at the same time with what i th reading about the scale to cultivate those in a, in a smaller, more that will um, give a great advantage to kids that are able to be in such a setting. Um, yeah, and what do you do about, you know, like athletics and kind of those, that piece that is probably a bit different in yeah, sure. a school like this? Sure. So we are starting off with um, some sports that are more able to be fielded um, by smaller um, numbers of kids. Uh, volleyball, likely soccer, uh, likely cross country, tennis, some of those that just kids with with, with interest in that. Mm -hmm. um, some of the larger sports we won't be able to offer, at least at first. And that's something that we are uh, transparent about we're doing something a little bit different yeah. I would say for the school popularity for the for the school population um, also uh, LARP live action role play is 
kind of kind of feel like a varsity sport that's something our kids are are, are really interested in um, as well so if we're not having sports maybe by the traditional definition a lot of the stuff that you get from sports um, we can we can provide in other ways yeah um, and then this is a question because a lot of the families we work with, you know, and a lot of times with gifted learners, there are areas of, you know, exceptionality. And then there are also some areas that students are, you know, areas for growth and things that they're working on. And I know, um, like, what kinds of um, challenges with kids do you feel like? tessellations could support and which is not the best fit you know like who's a good fit even if they have some kind of um you know super exceptionality and then another like exceptionality or neurodiversity or something like that yeah yeah i think that um neurodiversity is 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 fundamental to part of a, a, a vision of 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 of, of diversity of of, of right. DEI, you know, there are so many um, fundamental um, areas that we think about when we demonstrate not only uh, respect for the dignity of all different types of learners, um, but also the kind of culture that's necessary to make sure that they're served. Um, in terms of us being a small school, um, you know, there are other schools, maybe like. Um, uh, Charles Armstrong that will have dedicated counselor, you know, that that, that right. have a, a a faculty infrastructure to make sure that everyone is supported in that way. Um, that's not something that 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 we um, can provide mm -hmm. um, just because it's a new school and it's a small to allocate resources how we allocate them. Right. Um, ha having said that, um, you know, kids that can self-advocate for accommodations that that they know about, um, these are kids uh, that that meet that category that are already in our school. Um, and so I think that that's that's something that that's important, something yeah. that we respect, something that's that's um, fundamental to having the kind of um, atmosphere that maybe you felt um, when you were at Tessie. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few other things that I would speak to about that. One is competency-based learning, which is something that we uh, believe in very strongly. And um, some of the aspects of this, maybe for uh, listeners who may not be um, fully versed in competency-based learning, it really focuses on um, growth over time, uh, as opposed to just seat time. Just, just being in a class doesn't mean that you're advancing through the class. Um, but it recognizes that kids are going to go through um, the understandings and the progression of a, of a continuum of learning at a pace that is individualized. So uh, different, differentiated instruction, um, that's really, really important in this model. Um, making sure that kids have different ways to demonstrate evidence of mastery of the quadratic formula. Um, will that take place on a test? Sure, but there are other ways that kids can demonstrate understanding that speak a bit more to their own uh, pathways of understanding. Yeah. Um, I would also say that um, the culture of the school contributes to this. As I was saying, we're really very intentional about having a school that rewards intrinsic motivation, um, is not pitting kids against, like the, the bell curve that kind of pits kids against one another is something that I think uh, causes a lot of unnecessary stress um, for everybody and disproportionately so yep. for neurodiverse kids. Um, you know, and professional development. These are all kind of um, fundamental pieces to make sure that we do have um, equity among different types of learners. Um, and I think that that's something really important uh, for the school. Yeah. Um, they would have to be, I would, I would finally say, you know, we, we Doing projects is important. Um, and, and I think that the way that we're structuring these things um, uh, is, is with a process that helps kids that might struggle with this to have greater efficacy in their pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, but kids that are already oriented towards, um, I have rolled up sleeves, uh, got these up for, for a reason, for a metaphor, um, ki kids that are ready to roll up their sleeves and, and engage in a project that's meaningful to them, that, that's also something that's important. So I would say um, kids that enjoy um, doing stuff, not just um, receiving information and mimicking it back. Right, right, right. 
Um, great. And so how do, like, what's the best way if a family is interested in learning more, um, what kind of opportunities do they have for that and what kind of steps should they take? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, got a lot of nice resources on the website. Um, we've got, um, uh, you know, information sessions uh, that are posted. Um, definitely to to fill out an application if you're interested. Um, I would be very happy for you to put my my email uh, in the bottom of this. I'm happy to to talk with anyone or or put you in touch with our uh, admissions director to um, have a call, come by and have a visit. Uh, we're always happy to chat. Great, great. And um, I just had a question and then it flew out. Um, that it flew out. It may come back. It might. It might. Um, yep, it's gone. <laughs> it's a butterfly. It happens. You know. it happens. Um, do you think, oh, so what? what is your role? What's your title? I'm the director of high school education. Okay. And are you and, also uh, teaching in the program? Um, I will, I don't know. Um, I, I think that most of the areas that um, that I would be most uh, adept at teaching, I think that we, you know, we're in the, we're in the hiring process and um, we are not, that hasn't been concluded yet, but I, I would say um, it, it's exciting. Uh, we have an extraordinary cohort. Uh, the, the number of applications that we received is more than um, more than 100 for each position wow uh, english humanities mandarin math science so hundreds of applications for teachers have come in and uh, those that we've uh, interviewed so far i'm really excited and and i think that the folks that would um, occupy the the history and the english part which is what i do best are probably a little bit better than, than what I would be bringing to the table. I'm maybe more in the uh, managerial uh, aspect of it, though I do love teaching. And I taught for many, many years, uh, literature, history, and uh, a few other things I pinch hit at um, when, when called upon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did remember what I was going to ask. And it is, do you, you know, it being a private school, um, is there a... Are there scholarships potentially available for families? Like if the funding, you know, if the financial aspect is a limitation, should they still reach out? Absolutely. Yeah, we do have financial aid available. We do have a, uh, a scholarship um, that was earmarked for uh, for a girl. Um, that was just the earmark on the scholarship um, that we got yeah. uh, from a, a very, very generous donor. Uh, but there are other types of financial aid that are available. We use the the, the standard um, SSS platform that other um, our other among our peer schools uh, make use of as well. Yep. Great. All right. Well, I, you know, this was a great conversation. Thank you. It's really enlightening. You know, um, I appreciate living in an area where there are so many different opportunities for education. I think a lot of people go public and a lot of people go private for the very reason of finding a fit that's more geared toward the kids that they know they have, like where they would thrive. So it's yeah. very nice to know that um, Tessellations is expanding to yep. to high school yeah it's really exciting to be a part of something that is um new and burgeoning and i also think that it is really um filling a need uh for kids that um you know for all the reasons that i that i've spoken about i i, I do think that too much of high, too many high schools really are just grinding kids down and and um, making a lot of the wrong decisions about what constitutes a system that promotes creativity and the kind of things that are going to help us to solve the problems of tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine who I would be if I had been in a different system sooner, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Um, yeah. I think it's uh, very timely and I don't think it's just the kids who are burning out, but the educators as well, you know, Yeah. for, you know, um, 
one final little anecdote. Um, uh, one of the, you know, in the in the early years of of of, of my teaching career, which was also the early uh, years of the internet, just at the at the cusp of of YouTube um, coming into being invented, I remember watching the Sir Kenneth Robinson. Um, uh, the school, the schools kill creativity hmm. from 2006. And uh, if you haven't seen it, or if you haven't seen it recently, go back and watch it. And um, it is a, it's a TED talk that has um, at last check. And I looked at this not so long ago, it had a billion views, Wow! a TED talk on school <laughs> with a billion views. And um and that's because it resonates. It's powerful. Do schools kill creativity? And I remember watching this and I remember crying and I've watched it since and I've cried since when he's talking about, you know, what happens to kids and their creativity over the course of their time um, in school. And whenever I was watching that in 2006 and, and, and even more recently, I remember listening to the stories he told and, and the ethos he presents and being sincerely moved, but also feeling a certain degree of cynicism about, well, that sounds nice as a story, but what does this look like on a schedule? How do we make a school that that doesn't do that? Right. And whenever I was watching that in 2006, th that was my response as a young administrator and, you know, over the course of the last 18 years, this body of research and a cohort of schools who are leaning into competency-based learning and who are paying attention to the kind of things that Challenge Success talks about and who are creating a different type of high school, we know what to do now. Um, when I look at, uh, you know, the work of Thomas Kelly on uh, creativity and creative confidence, when I look at the work of Desi and Ryan on, um, you know, self-determination theory and how that's probably told in a more friendly way by Daniel Pink in his book, Drive. Um, you know, th there's so much good stuff out there about uh, researched backed ways to make school, especially high school, better. Yeah. Ironically, you know, Reggio Emilia, Montessori, Waldorf schools, these are things that we're doing pretty well. For, for for little ones, even kind of through middle school. But man, you get to high school and you hit a wall and it doesn't have to be that way. There's a lot of things that we can do um, to make high school better. And that's what we're trying to do at Tessellations and come along for the ride, accepting yeah. applications. <laughs> awesome. Well, that, thank you so much, Michael. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for enlightening me. My great pleasure. <laughs>Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mind by Design podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with a friend. And if you haven't already, subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast player. And if you have any questions or comments or would like to be a guest on my show, you can reach me directly at Jana at themindbydesign.com or just visit the website at www.themindbydesign.com. Thank you for listening. And remember, I'm here to help.